Hi folks. Um, let's start our uh, lecture here on bird brain behavior. One of the reasons birds have fascinated people is not only because of their bright colors and musical songs, but also because of their behaviors. You know, whether it's um, grebes with their elaborate uh, dances across the surface of the water or the broken wing displays of uh, plovers like this killdeer. Um, those are the kinds of things that just really fascinate us as human beings. And when we think about these complex displays or behaviors that we see, um, we almost um, always think about these in terms of kind of two ways that those behaviors can be acquired. We often think, well, is that behavior learned, um, something that's been modified through the experience of the bird, or is it innate um, or instinctive? Um, oftentimes we think of these innate or instinctive kinds of behaviors as um, more primitive, um, less complex. But if you actually think about what innate means, it's one of those things where you should probably stop and, and just pause for a while. Because what that means is that that entire behavior has been coded for in the genetic material, in the DNA. And somehow... In this process of transcription and translation, going from the double-stranded DNA to proteins, that codes for complex behaviors in animals. And in that sense, innate or instinctive behaviors are, are almost magical uh, when you think about how that can occur from something like a double-stranded DNA molecule telling a bird like a killdeer how to behave when its nest is threatened. The other thing about behavior in birds is that because they're so easy to study, birds became kind of the model for our fundamental understanding of animal behavior. And some of the, the greatest advances in animal behavior, and in fact really the field of animal, be animal behavior, was founded to a large extent on observations of birds. Um, so let's go ahead and, and take a look at these. We're going to start with some of these innate behaviors and then um, move into more complex ones. So let's take this innate or instinctive um, behavior and we'll take, um, first of all, some of the characteristics. How would we know an innate or instinctive behavior? How would we distinguish that from something that was learned? A, a couple of characteristics. Um, first of all, um, innate behaviors tend to be stereotyped. And, and what I mean by this is that um, whenever an animal performs the behavior, it's always done in the same way. Uh, so if it's, we've got an innate behavior, when that animal does it, it's just the same thing over and over and over again. We may get variation between individuals, slight variation in innate, innate behaviors, but within individuals, it's always very stereotyped, always done the same way. As I already said, it's genetically based, which is really amazing to think that DNA could code for, for a, a behavior. Um, it develops in isolation. And what I mean here is that there doesn't have to be any other kinds of birds around. We can isolate birds. And so if we want to study innate behaviors, one of the things we want to do is try to isolate the bird from any other kinds of experiences that might allow it to learn um, and modify its behavior. The other thing, which is going to be kind of a recurring theme here, we're going to see how it kind of colored our view of um, intelligence in birds, is that it, if it's taken out of context, if you take the bird out of the system in which that innate behavior had evolved, they can often seem maladaptive um, and, um, and sometimes just plain stupid. All right, so let's start with a, a, the simplest kind of innate behavior. And this is going to be a simple stimulus response system. Um, and so we've got something which is going to be the, act as the stimulus. This is some sort of external cue. Um, and once the animal sees that, that's going to initiate this kind of innate behavior. And probably the simplest thing is this gaping mouth that a nestling bird would have. Um, again, when a parent comes back to the nest, all the young will lift their heads and spread their mouths open, and you'll see this kind of thing. And simply seeing this brightly colored mouth here is enough to cause an, an instinctive or innate response of shoving food into it. Um, and so we come back, if we look at this nest, for example, we've got three nestlings, and we've got two of them like this, and then we've got this great big guy here. And, and this isn't bigger than this guy. I mean, he's like twice as big, but 
that's not because he's been fed more, obviously. Uh, we've got something else going on here. And, and you can imagine that if a parent comes back and sees this mouth and this mouth and this mouth, this is what they're going to shove food in. So what's going on in this nest? Um, well, you already know that. You know what's going on. That's some um, interspecific brood parasitism. We've got a brood parasite here. Um, here's the host young. Um, and what the parasite has done in this sense, um, it has uh, basically taken over this innate response of the parent and used it against it. All right? So if a parent has a choice of sticking something in here or here, which is going to be the stronger stimulus? This is. So where's the food going to go? Into the mouth of the brood parasite to the disadvantage of its own babies. So again, if we take this out of context, um, odd things can happen. One of the most famous is this, uh, this photograph taken from the 60s. And, and if you go online and, and put in cardinal feeding goldfish, you'll see the same thing. And basically what we've got is this male cardinal um, happened to have a beak full of food, came down by this um, goldfish pond, and the fish approached. And, of course, they did what goldfish or koi do when they come to the edge of a pond. They, they move their mouths. The male looked down. He saw something that looked like this releaser, and he shoved food in it. Um, and he just kept doing that. He'd go get some more food, he'd come back, and he'd stuff it into the mouths of the goldfish. Um, and again, it, it, it has all those characteristics of what we think of as an innate behavior. It's very stereotyped, it's genetically based, he hasn't learned this, it develops in isolation, and it can seem maladaptive when you take it out of the context. Obviously, getting food into that baby evolutionarily is one of the most important things you can do if you're going to have high fitness. Um, and so that's going to be a really strong releaser. You take it out of context and you get these kind of odd behaviors occurring. All right. <clears throat> One of the most kind of the classic example of a stimulus response, um, which was um, uh, carried out by two giants in the field of animal behavior, the the folks who really um, established the field of animal behavior, Nico Tinbergen and Conrad Lorenz, was done in the late 1930s. Um, so Tinbergen came over to, uh, to Conrad uh, Lorenz's uh, uh, area of study there in, in, in Austria, and they began doing these experiments where they would fly cardboard cutouts over these young birds, so ducklings and goslings, um, and poults of turkeys um, to see how they would respond to these shapes. Um, and they had all sorts of different shapes. You can see there were some that were hawk and falcon-like. They had others that were like ducks um, or seabirds. Um, <clears throat> and then they had like for control this, this round disc. Um, but the, the hypothesis they were really testing was based on some observations done before where folks argued that if you had a shape um, that had a long front to it and a short back, and you flew it across, that looks kind of like waterfowl. It looks like a goose or a duck. But if you take the same shape and you fly it in the other direction, that starts looking like one of our occipiter hawks with this kind of blunt head and this long tail. Um, and so they tested this, um, and, and they did this in the late 1930s, right before World War II started, um, and so it's interesting, later in their careers, both men came back and thought about those experiments and wrote about those experiments that they had done together, but they interpreted them in slightly different ways. So Tim Bergen, um, after the war, started writing about this, and he said that ducks, geese, and turkeys all responded to this hawk shape. Okay? Lorenz said in his memory it was only the turkeys that did that. Um, and, he, and he wasn't convinced it was that consistent. But Tinbergen's was the idea that really took off, okay? Um, and he hypothesized, therefore, that there was this innate ability to recognize a predator shape, the short neck and the long tail, from non-predator long neck, short tail um, uh, shapes. Um, and, and this really kind of caught on, this, this idea. Well, in 1961, many years later, um, Lorenz and his group came back and, and decided to look at this in more detail. Um, and uh, basically what they did is they took these baby turkeys again. They were naive. They hadn't been exposed to anything. Um, <clears throat> and again, they repeat, repeated the same experiment. So here we've got days here. So um, if you think about they take these babies and they show them all these things and they say, how do they respond to them? 
And the thing I want you to notice is that in that those early stage, uh, early days, the first stage of the experiment, it doesn't matter what the shape is. It could be hawk, it could be goose, or it could be that circle. They're all responding fairly strongly to that with uh, the number of alarm calls here, right? Um, and so they showed them all these things in the first couple of days, and then they just showed them either the goose or the hawk model, one of these two things. And what they did, um, they only got half the experiment done. So they did the first half, and what they, what they were thinking is, is that maybe it's just how often they're seeing one of these shapes that's really making the difference. So what they did is they, they started flying these over every day, but in a particular day, they would fly the goose shape over nine times, and then they'd fly the hawk shape over only one time. So they were seeing, the little baby turkeys were seeing the goose shape nine times more often than the hawk shape. And they just kept doing this um, uh, for this entire period here. And the thing to notice is that, well, it does look like they're responding more to the hawk shape than to the goose shape, but it doesn't take long. And what we see is that they stop reacting. They seem to become used to the shapes going by. Um, they become habituated to those shapes. So then after all this time, they come back and they take the real models again, right? So they take the real hawk and the real goose and the real <laughs> disc, um, and they fly it over these guys. Well, what they see is, again, the goose doesn't uh, uh, get much response, but Look up here. The thing that gets the highest response is this disc way up here, and then the disc and the hawk right here. So, so the birds are not recognizing a hawk shape. What they're recognizing is this thing that they haven't seen for a really long time, and it's eliciting this response. And so based on this experiment, um, they said it's not the predator shape. It's not predator shape recognition that is innate in these guys. But instead, it's just a simple rule, and that is that you react to rare object movement. So if you, if you haven't ever seen this thing before and it flies slowly over your cage, you're going to react to it. But if you keep seeing it over and over and over again and nothing happens, you habituate to it. Um, and then you just respond to those rare things. And this makes a lot of sense. Um, if, if a bird reacted every time something flew over, it would be reacting all the time. Um, and certainly predators are much rarer than non-predator birds. Um, and so you learn, you habituate to those things that are common in the environment, but you really focus in on those odd things. And this is often important for innate behaviors, to have a relatively simple rule. You can imagine it would be a lot harder to code in the DNA um, some shape that you respond to as opposed to the simple rule of react to things that are um, uh, rare um, and then habituate to those that become more common. Now the interesting thing is this idea of being able to recognize predator shapes got so strongly entrenched in people's ideas or, or minds that a whole industry has grown up over this. So you've probably seen these. You know, you have these hawk shapes and you taste them to your window and, oh, the birds will see the hawk shape and they'll stay away. But, but clearly that, that doesn't work, right? They're going to become habituated to it. Um, and so even when you do something like this and mix a truth, yes, birds can see in the ultraviolet and so this is what you'd see and this is what the birds see. So this is even better, right? Because now you've got these ultraviolet hawk things. But, but that's not going to work, right? It's, it's not going to work. Because... Birds are flying into a windows for other reasons. What kills birds is a reflection. When they see sky, when they see branches up here, it just looks like the habitat is continuing in space. And so they just keep flying. I mean, this looks like blue sky. I'll just keep flying right into it. Um, and it's the reflection that ends up kill, uh, killing the animals. So the only way those hawk shapes would work is if you stuck them on the outside of the window. So it kind of made this seem more like a wall and less like sky and trees. And this may seem not that important, but it turns out that there is actually really high mortality due to window kills in birds. Um, th these are birds that were collected in Toronto, Canada. Um, the researcher simply went around every morning. Many birds migrate at night. Um, and, and so he went around to these, these buildings and collected all these uh, bird carcasses. And you can see not only the number, but the diversity of birds that were being killed by these window strikes. 
Um, and some folks have tried to estimate, and this is a very difficult thing to estimate, obviously, um, causes of mortality for birds. Um, and they've looked at everything from hunting to pesticides to wind turbines, things you often hear about. Um, and the two big ones that you'll see here are feral cats and windows. And windows is like twice as high as the feral cats. So even if these numbers aren't exact, even if they're relatively close to what's going on, a huge number of birds are dying um, from window kills um, every year. And again, the important thing to think about is this is mortality that they never saw evolutionarily, right? So this is going to be additive mortality. It's going to be on top of all those other things that are causing mortality. So really trying to solve this problem becomes important. All right. So we've been basically talking about simple, fix, uh, simple stimulus response um, kind of behaviors. Um, but we can get more complex behaviors as well. Well, that can be um, genetically hardwired in the in the animals. I mean, and um, Conrad Lorenz actually um, coined this idea of this fixed action pattern, um, and it would be stimulated by again some sort of a, uh, a a stimulus. In this case, he called it an innate releasing mechanism or IRM, and he defined a FAP as an innate behavior, um, which is this complex series of behaviors that are linked together. Um, and that series of behaviors is performed complete at the very first time. So the bird just does it all the way through. And it's going to continue to completion even if you remove the stimulus. And the example that he used was this example of egg rolling. And Lorenz did a lot of studies with these gray leg geese. Um, and basically what he would do is he, he, if you take a, a um, goose on the nest and you place an egg next to her, she will go through this very stereotypic behavior where she'll come out, grab the egg, and roll it back into the nest. Um, and this makes a lot of sense. If an, if an animal sees an egg near its nest, it's probably its own egg. It's invested a lot in that egg, so it would be very important um, to have kind of a hardwired response to get that egg back in the nest and not lose that investment. The thing is that if you pull the egg away as the goose is doing this behavior, she continues to do the same behavior as if the egg is still there. That's the complex series that continues to completion even in the absence of the stimulus. And the other thing that you can see is if you replace that egg with something else that's kind of roughly an egg shape, she'll also bring that back to the nest. Um, and so you can find goose nests, for example, which will have things like golf balls or light bulbs, um, any kind of egg shape um, she'll bring back to that. So again, here we've got an innate behavior where if you take it out of context, it starts s seeming to be maladaptive. But in context, it's extremely adaptive. Okay, slightly more complex. So, so we've been, been moving up from simple stimulus response to a fixed action pattern. Now we're going to get this idea of imprinting, which most people are pretty familiar with. Um, again, this is going to be basically programmed learning during a sensitive or a critical period. Okay, so what do we mean? We've already seen this with bird song, right? We know that the innate part of bird song for something like a white crowned sparrow, for example, is um, this template that tells it to listen to a certain kind of song and to learn that song. So that's the innate part. Okay, um, and then it will learn uh, if you're a white crowned sparrow for for 50 days um, during that early life, and then it'll close down. You won't learn after that. So this is the idea of of um, uh, imprinting. But Lorenz uh, didn't use song learning as his basis. Instead, he used this idea of what happens with young goslings, um, and so. The, the innate part of this is that goslings will follow. After they hatch, they will follow the first thing they see moving. And then the learning part of it is they will learn the characteristics of whatever they're following. So normally, the first thing that would be moving after they hatch is going to be mom. And they will follow mom goose. Um, and as they're going along and doing that, they are learning the characteristics of mom. And that becomes their own kind of identity. That what, that's what tells them, that's what I am. I am a goose. Now, if you don't give them a mama goose when they hatch, and instead you have Conrad Lorenz, the first thing that moves, then the geese follow Conrad Lorenz, and as they're following him, swimming along or coming down the, the road with him, they are learning that Conrad Lorenz is what I am. I am Conrad Lorenz. Um, 
And one uh, thing we have to take care of if we're going to be doing raising young in, in captivity for conservation purposes is to make sure they don't imprint on humans. Um, because it can occur that when that goose um, becomes an adult and decides to breed, it's going to look around for a mate, and it's not going to be looking for a goose. It's going to be looking for something that looks like Conrad Lorenz. Uh, so that, that's kind of classic imprinting. Okay, um, And so this kind of seems kind of dumb. It seems kind of crazy why you would have that behavior. But if you think about it in context, once again, we have to think about it in context, this makes a lot of sense. The first thing a goose would normally see would be um, its mom. The other thing is that if you give a goose a choice between Con of Conrad Lorenz and a goose, those goslings will follow the goose. Okay, So there is this preferential learning if given the choice. Um, and it's only when we kind of push it beyond that context that we start seeing it acting in some sort of maladaptive way. That said, these instinctive or innate behaviors, which seem maladaptive and seem kind of stupid, kind of led us to think about birds in a different way than we thought about mammals, okay? Um, and so, um, you know, that the expression bird brain um, came out of these early studies of it seemed like birds were just kind of all these genetically programmed um, behaviors that, that played out. And there was very little um, cognition or um, learning um, or modification of those plans. So this is just from an old textbook, and you can see this was kind of the view, right? So bird brains are small compared to most mammals, and most birds are poor at learning new skills. However, a bird is born with a huge number of programs built into its brain. So this is the old school view of bird brains. <clears throat> and so if we looked at that, the old view is this idea that if all the purple here represents kind of instinctive or innate behavior, most of a bird's brain would be made up of that. And very little of it would be this green part, which is responsible for co complex cognitive behavior. Whereas mammals, look at them. They, well, we've got some instinctive things, but most of our brain is up here, you know, this really complex cognitive behavior. Um, and, and actually, when we name parts of the brain initially, we would name, you know, these parts in the bird, things like the the paleopallium, uh, pallium, the paleopallium, the, the old pallium. And when we name that structure mammals, we call it the neopallium, the new pallium, because clearly mammals were so superior to birds. Um, <clears throat> and again, if we think about that evolutionary relationships that we spent all that time on in the early part of the course, uh, remember that birds and mammals are in different evolutionary lineages, right? They, they've been separated for millions and millions of years. Um, and so it wouldn't be surprising that if they do have ability to learn and higher cognitive processes, that birds would be different than mammals because they've had a separate evolutionary trajectory. We already know that birds and mammals have converged on some characteristics like endothermy, right? Mammals and birds are both endothermic. It's not because they got it from a common ancestor. It's because they independently evolved endothermy. And so if we're going to see this higher thought press in, bra in the brains of birds, we can expect that it might be due to convergence. And one of the things we know about convergence is even if the endpoint looks similar, the way you get there is different, okay? And we might expect some differences in structure. And in fact, that's what we find. So recent work has, has demonstrated that, yes, bird brains do tend to be smaller than mammals of similar sizes. But if you look at a gram of bird brain compared to a gram of mammal brain, what you'll find is that there's actually more neurons in the gram of bird brain. So bird brains don't have to be as big because they've got more neurons packed into them than the same amount of brain mass of a mammal. So it's not that, that birds have a brain like mammals. Of course they don't have a brain like mammals. They have a different brain. Um, and if they have higher cognitive processes, they got there in a different way. Higher density, smaller size. Okay, I'm going to take a real quick aside here. 
uh, I just thought I'd throw this in. As long as we're talking about brains, um, uh, remember the the little video that Karina shared with us uh, with a woodcock doing his little dance, um, which makes me laugh every time I think about it. It's it's right down here if you want to see it again. There we go. Um, and, and remember one of the things we said was that the woodcock has those really big eyes that are set way back on its head, so you can see you know here's a gull and and here's this woodcock. Look at how those huge eyes. So the eye is much bigger than what you're seeing there, and it's almost to the back of the skull. Well, if you fill up that much space, what happens? happens to the brain. Well, you can see it's going to be pushed back into the very back part of the skull, and it does this. So, I mean, the brain is basically upside down in a woodcock skull with with a spinal cord not coming out the back of the brain like we expect back here, but actually underneath. And that may be kind of why he's got this weird kind of position that he holds his head in. Um, but anyway, I just, it's just kind of a cool... Um, consequence of having these great big eyes shoved to the back of the skull. Uh, so the woodcock, uh, interesting in lots of ways, and, and another way is that he's got an upside-down brain. <clears throat> All right. So what we've found over the last few years, and the video that you're going to watch is uh, the assignment to go along with this, uh, really underscores this, is that birds have really complex behaviors, and, and they are certainly capable of modifying behavior through learning. And that's really all learning is, is um, behavior modified by experience. Um, and when we talk about learning, there's a couple of different kinds of learning that, that we can define. One of, this, one of them is insight learning. And this is like um, the aha, I figured it out kind of thing, the, the Einstein moment. Um, and a great example of this are these um, great tits in England. Uh, again, they're kind of like our tit mice and chickadees in the family parody. Um, and uh, this is something that happened back when Folks were still getting milk delivered to their houses in glass bottles with these little foil tops. And at some point, one of these great tits discovered, he's probably kind of playing around with a lid, and he discovered that if you poke a hole in the foil and peel it back, you get this great drink of this energy, fat, nutritional milk. Um, and so that was the aha moment. That was the insight learning. One of these guys figured out, poke a hole, pull the foil back, and you get this great food reward. Well, the next step in that was that very soon it started to spread through the tit populations. And the question is, well, how do they do that? Well, that takes a different kind of learning. That's something called associative learning, where other birds learn to do this behavior by watching them. So another great tit watches this one open the milk bottle and goes, wow, that's that's amazing. I'm going to try that. And so then he tries it, and, and other birds watch him, and it spreads very quickly. And in fact, in England, you'll notice this guy looks different than these guys, right? The blue tit, a different species, actually learned how to do it from the great tits, right? So we've got great examples of insight learning and associative learning um, in these birds. Obviously, there's um, uh, other examples of, of how far birds have gone down this kind of higher cognitive process uh, pathway. One of the things we used to think is that, you know, tool uh, use um, was really kind of something that separated humans from, from other animals. The idea to be able to pick up an inanimate object and realize that you could do something with this inanimate object that you couldn't do without it. That's a really higher cognitive process. Um, and so, um, you know, we thought this was amazing when Jane Goodall found out that, you know, chimps use these grass stems and sticks to reach into termite mounds to, to pull ter termites out. But very quickly, you know, there were other examples from birds doing the similar thing. So Caledonian crows and woodpecker finches of the Galapagos um, will use these sticks and spines to probe into holes and pull grubs out. They're not woodpeckers, that, but they basically get the same food that a woodpecker could get by using this tool. Um, other cognitive processes, uh, one of the challenges we give chimps is to hang a banana on a string and then you know, see what happens, see what kind of insight learning might happen. And they'll pile these boxes on top until they finally reach up and get it. Birds like crows and ravens solve that in a different way, but they still show the same kind of insight learning that we often think is regulated to these higher primates, our closest relative. And you're going to see lots and lots of examples of this in the video that I've assigned. All right. The second thing I want to kind of talk about in this lecture is, is the timing of behavior. Um, so we've been talking a lot about the annual cycle of birds and how you go from winter behaviors to spring behaviors to summer behaviors. 
And a lot of times those behaviors are really, really different if you think about it, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, they're, they're not reproductive in the winter, but they become reproductive in, 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 the, in the spring. Um, they're going to go through a complete molt um, at a particular time of the year. Um, they are going to migrate at certain times of the year. These are all really time-dependent kinds of behaviors. And the question is, how do they time those events to occur at the right, right times? Um, what drives that? Um, <clears throat> a couple of terms um, here. One is we can talk about ultimate factors. What determined the timing um, of this? And, and if we think about evolutionarily what determines the timing of breeding, for example, well, it's going to be food availability. Um, and this is going to act at the population level, right? So if some individuals breed too early so that they don't hit that peak in food abundance, they're not, their young aren't going to survive, their genes aren't going to be passed on, they'll be selected out of the population. That's evolution acting at the population level. And so over time, the population becomes adapted to breed during the time when you have the highest food availability. But we can also think about proximate factors. We can think about the individual. But what is it that causes the individual to actually respond so it breeds at the right time? So it's not one of the ones that gets selected out, but one of the ones that actually has high fitness. And those are going to be proximate factors. These are going to be the immediate factors that affect the physiology and behavior of individuals. So think of ultimate factors as acting at the population level, kind of evolutionarily, and the proximate factors are the immediate factors that are causing changes in an individual's behavior. So one example is we're going to go to over to Australia, where we have a really highly unpredictable environment. Okay, so um, <clears throat> arid Australia is really hard to predict when that peak of food supply is going to come because the food supply depends on rains, and rains are often really hard to predict in this arid part of Australia. Um, and so we're going to talk about these, these birds right here, zebra finches. You can see them in, in any pet store, really common uh, cage birds. Um, but they're from this. This is where they evolved, okay? So one of the things they have, one adaptation they have, is that their reproductive organs can develop really, really rapidly, more rapidly than, than most other birds. So once the hormones start, their gonads can get big pretty fast. But the question is, what are they going to use as a cue to tell them when to start those gonads getting bigger? And it turns out that if you're going to match reproduction for, for um, highest food production, you've got to do that when it rains. So what proximate cue are you going to tell them to ramp up reproduction? What are you going to use? You can't use the food because that hasn't happened yet. So what do you use? You use rain or increasing humidity, right? That's going to trigger the increased growth of testes and ovaries, right? Um, and so to kind of drive that home, We've got a little male here saying, hey, do you hear the thunder? That should get you going. That's the proximate cue, the thunder, the humidity, the rain. That's the proximate cue that will get them to breed at the right time. Okay? All right. Oops. Sorry, guys. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Ignore that break. All right, so in birds in predictable environments, instead, um, the ultimate factor of food is still going to occur at, at a certain time of the year. So for in the temperate zone, for example, when does most of the, the food occur? It's going to be in the summer. That's when you want to have your young out, late spring and summer. That's when you want to do that. Um, and and the, the thing about this is we know that if you can time it for that time period, because it's predictable, you should be able to get pretty good fitness um, out of that. So it's predictable by, by time. So if you can just kind of sense the seasons, the seasonal change, that, that the seasons are changing and that spring and summer is coming, you can start that kind of reproductive process. And so here, it can be timed. It becomes really, really important, right? So our little bald eagle is like, oh, my gosh, look at the time. I need to migrate so I can hit the summer peak food. Okay, so how's he going to do that? How does he tell time? How do the birds tell time? And it turns out <clears throat> that all animals have these internal clocks. And these can go at either a, a 24 hour, a, 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 a daily cycle, which we call circadian clocks. Um, but we also have an annual clock 
so that things will change seasonally. And this is just going on in our bodies all the time. So you may not know this, but if you look at human body temperature, for example, um, that temperature, now your temperature may, your average may be higher or lower, but we're all going to go through this kind of cycling through the 24 hours of the day. Um, and there's all sorts of other things, whether you're talking about urine volume or systolic pressure or melatonin production. This is going to be really important here. Um, we can see that it's cyclical. It's not just straight through time. Uh, it's not saying constant, but it's cycling over a 24-hour period. And if you take humans and you, and, 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 and you um, follow this through time, this will change seasonally as well. Okay, So we have both a daily clock and a... Um, annual clock that drives us and it will drive other organisms as well. So we have these internal factors, like internal clocks that might tell a bird, oh, it's time to migrate, it's time to start breeding. Um, but those are going to interact with external factors or exogenous factors. So we have endogenous factors like the internal clock, and we have exogenous factors. So here's our eagle. It comes flying up and it knows it's time to, I should be breeding. But when it gets to its breeding ground, this is what it's find. It finds, drought. That's an exogenous factor. And so here's our little eel. My internal clock says it's summer, but I don't feel much like reproducing. And so we've got exogenous factors like drought and food supply that can interact with those endogenous factors like hormones, the development of testes and ovaries to fine-tune this behavior. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so one of the cues um, that... Um, birds that live in the temperate zone can use to know that um, spring is on its way or that summer is on its way are changes in day length. Um, so again, uh, uh, the thing to remember is that the farther you are away from the equator, the greater this variation in day length is going to be. So we all know that, for example, we're going to have long days in the summer. We're going to have short days in the winter. We're at about 45 degrees right up in here or maybe down in here. Um, you can pick whichever you want, but you're going to see there's going to be this variation. The only place it's not going to play out is going to be the equator. So birds could potentially use day length, the length of time they experience sunlight, as an indicator of what season it is. And that could be used then as a proximate cue to tell them to start ramping up things like the growth of testes or, or ovaries. So the question is then, um, that's a really important factor, how do they sense it? How do they sense day length? Well, the obvious thing to think about is through the retina, right? So we got sun coming down, and the retina is going to be sensing how long it's being stimulated through the day, and that would be one thing. But one of the early experiments that was done um, uh, to first uh, explore this idea, um, they, they blinded birds. They, they took away the ability of the retina to receive. And they found out that those birds were still able to respond to changes in, in, in day length. Um, and so the question was, well, there's got to be something else that is picking up the sunlight. And it turns out that it's the pineal gland. Okay. Now, if you've been through vertebrate biology, you'll remember that um, lizards will have this little pineal eye on the top of their head. And it's photosensitive. Well, birds have a pineal gland on the top of the brain. And it turns out that sunlight can actually still affect that. Because if you remember, the skulls of birds are very, very thin. Um, and sunlight can actually get through those feathers and impinge on that pineal gland. It's not a huge amount of uh, light that's hitting it, but it's enough um, that they can sense it. Okay, um, So it turns out that the retina is important. So the retina is used. It's stimulated. So if you're not blinded, you can do this. But we're going to have a secondary way of sensing day length as, as well, and that's the pineal gland. And it actually turns out there's a third area of the brain that's also sensitive to day length and sunlight. So we've got the pineal gland. We've got the retina. Both of these are responding to, to sunlight and the length of days. Um, and those two things will produce this hormone called melatonin, um, which is going to be really important in kind of changing behavior. And then we've got a third part of the brain. It's the hypothalamus pituitary complex. And it's down here under the brain. So it's much harder to figure out how light is actually impa impacting that. We're not, not really quite sure how light is stimulating the hypothalamus. But the important thing I want you to think about is that we've got three ways of sensing changes in day length. And the pineal and the retina are going to work together to um, change levels of melatonin um, in response to those changes in day length. And those are going to bring about things like migration and so on. 
The hypothalamus is also going to be sensitive to changes in, in day length. But in this case, it's going to be responsible for um, growth of testes and ovaries and reproduction. Okay, so that just kind of uh, summarizes what I just went through. So know those two kind of different pathways and the three parts of the, the uh, body that are responding to changes in, in day length. Um, so this is really kind of cool. So if you can bring birds into the lab and, and you can keep them on short days um, or long days, and if you do this, you can experimentally show that melatonin production changes, right? So if we look at a, a time uh, and um, relative melatonin production, you can see that those are offset from each other. And this is going to bring out these, these could cause different hormonal cascades, different physiological responses, depending on whether you're getting melatonin at this cycle or at this cycle. So it's not really the amount of melatonin, but it's the pattern at which it's being released. So you can test this. So you can say, well, does this actually work? And so you can bring birds in to the lab in August, and you can take them through some shortening days, and then in October start lengthening the days, and by golly, in January, you've got birds that are in a reproductive condition, right? So, so this is how you can manipulate birds, simply by changing day length um, in these temperate zone birds. One of the really amazing things, and I'm just going to throw this in, is that when they did these experiments, you take the birds, you've got some of them on long days, you've got some of them on short days, and they show this difference, which is cool enough, right? Well, then, if you take out cells from the, the pineal gland, okay, up here, and you start growing them in this plate, and then you test the cells that are growing in the plate, the ones that were from birds on short days will show this cycle, and the ones that were from birds on long days will do this. The cells actually remember their internal clock completely outside of the bird. I mean, that's just crazy. Um, but it, it shows the strength of, of how these kind of chemical reactions. So now we're now we're really getting down to the to the nitty gritty of how chemical reactions in the brain can bring about these changes and things like reproduction and migration. All right, but what about tropical tropical birds? Remember that at the tropics you don't get these big changes in day length, right? It's always twelve hours and twelve nights. So as we get closer and closer to the tropics, birds aren't going to be able to use that as a cue, right? So what are they going to use? Okay, well it turns out that rather than those um, uh, day length changes, they're going to be relying more on those endogenous clocks, those, those annual, circannual rhythms that are going to tell them, okay, now it's coming along. And where do those come from? That's evolution shaping the population to respond at a, at a particular time. So it's basically setting the clock. Evolution is setting the clock. Um, so these birds know what time of the year to come into reproductive condition. And exogenous factors like food are going to interact with that. So I'm going to leave you with this little poem I came up with, the love song of the blue-footed booby, which is going to be tropical. Um, and so um, in, instead of responding to day length, they might say something like, if the season is right and there's lots of prey, to heck with photo period and length of day, we'll dance and mate and lay eggs all day. Well, at least one to three eggs, which is what the cluster size of these guys. All right. Okay, that's it. Here's your questions. Uh, review these. Make sure you do the reading. It's a very short paper, kind of a fun little thing to look at. Um, and watch the video. Again, you'll access that through Klein Library. All right, uh, that's it. Uh, I miss talking to you guys in person, but uh, this will have to do for now. Thanks. Bye.